Okay, thank you for tuning in, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenter and then let him uh, go ahead and uh, present the information he has. Uh, John Burge is the general manager of the North Platte Natural Resources District, and he is going to speak about groundwater regulations in the NRD. Uh, John is a Western Nebraska native who grew up on a corn and wheat farm north of Lisco, Nebraska, now general manager of the North Platte NRD. Uh, in this role, he's responsible for all operations of the district, whose purpose and authorities range from groundwater regulation and management to soil and water resource conservation, to the management of a rural water system in an area of nearly 3.5 million acres, covering five counties in the Nebraska Panhandle. And those include Scotts Bluff, Banner, Morrill, Garden, and the southern part of Sioux County. Mr. Burge manages a staff of 20 and a budget of $5 million. He joined the district after making the decision to return to rural America after leaving his career in Washington, D.C. In 2009, Birch was appointed White House Liaison to the Department of Agriculture by President Obama, where he was the principal liaison between the Executive Office of the President and the Office of the Secretary. Subsequently, John was appointed the Deputy and Acting Assistant Secretary for Congressional Relations where he managed all operations of that office. He was a member of the sub-cabinet and senior policy group and coordinated all interactions with members of Congress and other elected officials and USDA officials. Mr. Burge also served as the deputy administrator for field operations at the USDA Farm Service Agency, the executive director of the National Food and Agriculture Council at USDA. Earlier in his career, Bird served as the executive director of the Western Nebraska Community College Foundation in Scotts Bluff. Additionally, he served on the staffs of U.S. Senators Jim Exxon, Bob Carey, and Ben Nelson. He is a graduate of the University of Nebraska, Omaha, and a master's student at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. He and his wife, Carey, son Theodore, and daughter Bridget live in Gearing, Nebraska. So John, welcome today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dave, and thank you uh, to the university for allowing me to participate in this way. It's uh, an unusual circumstance that we're in, and I am not usually used to providing presentations to myself in a closed office, but I'm going to do my uh, level best. Uh, Dave mentioned that I'm going to be talking about uh, groundwater regulation. I am going to cover groundwater regulation, but I'm also going to be covering some of our incentive programs uh, that we have here some of our stakeholder outreach and kind of the overriding umbrella uh, as to why we do what we do with regard to water. So we're gonna get into uh, all of that. I wanted to point out on my first uh, slide here, this uh, photograph of the uh, North Platte River. This is uh, obviously in the upper part of the basin. This is actually a picture from Wyoming. Uh, but I think that uh, the title of my presentation sort of points out that we are living in an unlikely place. This is a place that uh, if the world was planning itself, uh, if we were the king for the day and we were planning where we were going to have production agriculture, we may not uh, think of Western Nebraska pre-irrigation project as a place where that ought to happen. So it truly is an unlikely place. The settlement of uh, Western Nebraska began in the 1880s, and as we all know, rainfall in this area is scarce. It was back then as well. And the uh, North Platte River, which runs through this area, relies uh, generally on snowpack that falls in the northern Colorado and southern Wyoming mountains. Um, this led to the uh, hope uh, for development of an irrigation project. Irrigation began in this area, I believe in 1885, with some uh, uh, direct diversions out of the North Platte River. And as uh, that development uh, ensued, uh, there were people that were pressing for a project to build uh, a much larger irrigation project on the North Platte River. And in 1903, the North Platte project was authorized as part of the Federal Rec uh, Reclamation Act. That project now extends 111 miles along the North Platte River, uh, providing uh, full service irrigation to 226,000 acres and an additional 100, roughly 110,000 acres 
of supplemental irrigation or commingled acres uh, in this area. The North Platte project uh, then created a number of tributaries. Uh, we all know these uh, tributaries that run north and south out of the uh, North Platte River drainage. Uh, we think of tub springs or dry spotted tail or wet spotted tail. Uh, those um, uh, streams are largely leakages uh, from the shallow aquifer system uh, that uh, is not normally recharged by the, by the uh, uh, not only the stream flow in the North Platte River, but also the stream flow uh, in the project. Without the Pathfinder ditch or the farmer's ditch on the northern side uh, of the river, uh, many of those uh, streams would not exist, nor would the habitats that they uh, create. And as many of you know, some of those um, uh, tributaries actually have water rights coming out of them as well. So it's extended uh, the ability for irrigation uh, to have those leakages uh, uh, too. Sorry, <laughs> missed the uh, missed the slide there. Um, during the uh, uh, production, or the, excuse me, the development of irrigation uh, technology, we have had uh, several different iterations of uh, irrigation delivery methods. Uh, those would include uh, what is loosely defined as flood uh, irrigation, pivot irrigation, and now uh, subsurface strip, although there are uh, different facets of each of those. So for flood irrigation, we have siphon tubes, we have gated pipe, uh, we have uh, plastic pipe, uh, those kinds of things. Pivot irrigation is exactly what, it's, uh, what it sounds like. And then subsurface strip is a relatively new technology that is becoming much more in vogue uh, than it once was and a little bit less expensive than it once was. Each of these iterations of irrigation technology improved efficiency, and it, each improvement proved to be also more expensive. And each irrigation type uh, has its pros and cons. Uh, we'll get back to that in a little while. Major crop types of the Nebraska Panhandle, I'm sure that all of you uh, know these, but we'll just uh, provide a, a quick list. Uh, hay, that can include both alfalfa and, and uh, uh, irrigated pasture. Winter wheat, corn, sugar beets, dry beans, peas, millet and other small grains, sunflowers and potatoes are sort of the uh, major crop types of the Nebraska Panhandle. Handle. That is not an all-encompassing list, but it's the ones that uh, really drive uh, the management decisions that we make here at the NRD and many of the people uh, involved in crop uh, management make around uh, this part of the Panhandle. Another bit of background, the Nebraska NRD system is a, a, a unique governance system, unique uh, only to Nebraska. Every state in the union has, has uh, conservation districts, but generally most of those are funded by uh, state governments, while ours in Nebraska are governed by a locally elected uh, board of directors uh, who sets the priorities and develops programs to establish all of our uh, uh, goals uh, in uh, trying to meet statutory objectives. The North Platte NRD, as Dave mentioned, is a little over uh, three million acres, about three and a half million acres of uh, land. It's got a population of about 45,000 people in 18 communities. Now only 14 of those uh, um, communities are incorporated, uh, leaving four unincorporated. Land use uh, is about 63% range, 33% uh, crop and pasture, and wetlands, forest, and other uses are about 4%. The balance of the uh, land use then is municipal development. I think as many of you know, water management in Nebraska has always been an issue, uh, but really became an issue in earnest in 2004 with the passage of LB 962. This is the piece of legislation that designated uh, certain parts of certain river basins as uh, fully and over appropriated. And it gave the State Department of Natural Resources the authority to make that designation. In the North Platte Natural Resources District, there were two areas that were designated as over appropriated. One is called the Pumpkin Creek Basin, which is in the southern part of our district, runs generally through Banner County and a very small sliver of Morrill County. And then also the North Platte River Valley, which is uh, generally the uh, riparian area along the river uh, from the state line all the way to Llewellyn. As a result of the designations of those areas, the district uh, with DNR 
uh, created its first integrated management plan, which outlined how all of the uh, water would be managed together, both surface and groundwater. That plan was adopted in uh, 2009, and the first increment ended then in 2019. And we have since uh, created our second increment, which I'll get to uh, in a moment. Also, as part of that process of the over-appropriated designation, we were also required to participate in and help to author a basin-wide plan for all of the Upper Platte uh, uh, Basin NRDs. That would include North Platte and South Platte, Twin Platte, Tri-Basin, and Central Platte. So that governs the area of the basin all the way uh, from the Wyoming state line uh, to uh, Eastern Hall County. As you'll note, as I mentioned, the uh, fully and over appropriated designation is uh, uh, something that we should probably put geospatially. So this map recognizes the over appropriated area of our district. You'll see at the uh, eastern side or the lower right hand side of that slide, there's kind of a controversial donut hole that exists in the over appropriated area in the North Platte River Valley. Uh, that was done. Uh, via modeling and has not changed even in our second increment, but is something that we are consistently reminded of of landowners down there uh, where we have lands on one side of a road that are not um, uh, regulated and then uh, lands on the other side of the road that are. In development of the integrated management plans, we have to uh, create a stakeholder uh, uh, type process in order to get those developed and ensure that we bring in all of the appropriate opinions and uh, perspectives as we develop those. Um, the, uh, because of our unique system and, and uh, connection of our surface water project, the North Platte project that I mentioned earlier, earlier in our groundwater um, uh, aquifers, um, there is a unique uh, correlation in ensuring that both groundwater producers, surface water producers, municipalities, and others are part of that stakeholder process. Uh, this uh, is a rendering of some of those people that were engaged in the process in 2009, uh, or excuse me, in 2019, which is a very similar type group uh, to those that were engaged uh, in 2009. Wanted to make mention of uh, the modeling uh, that we do in this uh, part of the state. We're a little bit different than other parts of the state in that we uh, utilize uh, real data rather than estimated data in order to make management decisions. The Western Water Use Management Model is the uh, model that governs not only this NRD, but also the NRD to the north, the Upper Niobrara White NRD, and also the uh, NRD to the south, the South Platte NRD. Um, the major goals of this particular model are to understand water use and how it changes over time, understand the uh, uh, interlink between the surface and groundwater, and uh, to make sure that those IMP goals are being uh, met. We want to make sure that drought, conservation uh, measures, groundwater pumping, uh, and surface water diversions are all calculated into those water use. Uh, and then it helps us to evaluate our management decisions. At, given different points during the year so that we can alter those if needed. The water planning and stakeholder process not only impacts the integrated management plan, as I mentioned before, but it really impacts every management decision that we have made over the uh, course of time. Um, some of those have been regulation, and then we'll get to some incentives in a little while. The very first uh, uh, regulation that uh, this district undertook was putting a moratorium on well drilling and acreage development. Um, that was an engaged process. People were very concerned about limiting uh, development of ground for agricultural production because our economy is so heavily dependent upon it. We then put a, we then required certification of all groundwater uses. Again, a very controversial decision uh, because that would uh, uh, limit for the foreseeable future and uh, in turn almost indefinitely uh, the ability for future uh, certification of groundwater areas. We required metering of all the irrigation wells. So that was a controversial issue because it was a um, predecessor to the uh, now uh, in force allocations in both the North Platte River Valley and the Pumpkin Creek Basin. 
the 70, the 70 inches over five years and the 60 inches over five years were determined to be a deficit level of irrigation in both, uh, in both um, uh, basins in our district. Uh, but over the course of the past two or three years, um, the average use uh, in each of those basins is well below uh, the 14 or 12 inches respectively in each of those basins. We are average somewhere in the neighborhood of nine and a half to 10 inches per uh, acre for the past uh, several years in this district. We also have ingo involved stakeholders in the creation of incentives. Um, we have engaged them uh, through regular board meetings, engaged them through producer roundtables, and engaged them through very formal uh, stakeholder processes. But those incentives could include retirements and temporary leases, we have a surface water intentional recharge project that we've been working on now for three years that will be operational this year on the Enterprise Irrigation District. We have an allegation buy down program um, and also a bonus payment for federal and state programs. We do a lot of cost share here. We spend somewhere between $200,000 and $400,000 a year on cost share for uh, water management technology. We have a tel uh, telemetry program that was entirely cr uh, grant funded that uh, provides real-time data to uh, landowners to help them make better watering decisions. We've uh, done an alternative cropping program, and then we're engaged in something called TAP H2O, which essentially turns your cell phone into your own personal uh, telemetry um, uh, unit. <clears throat> I want to go through each one of these uh, incentives uh, so that we can talk about some of the uh, capacity of each one of them to um, assist us in meeting our goals and, and uh, objectives. The pros of uh, leases uh, in retirements are obviously a, a immediate reduction in consumptive use. They're voluntary and they get marginal land out of production, but they're extraordinarily expensive and they also remove irrigated land from property tax rolls. So the board over the course of the past couple of years has sort of taken us in a different direction uh, on some of the incentive programs that we should be uh, seeking to complete. Um, surface water intentional recharge. This is a picture of that project on Enterprise Irrigation District. We acquired four irrigated farmland leases. and We have uh, the uh, opportunity to expand that with a few more leases uh, to divert water that is normally uh, put onto cropland, take that consumptive use, put it into a constructed recharge pit, and then recharge that into the aquifer, maintaining historic timing back to the river. Uh, this is really a win-win for us and the irrigation district and the landowners to try to uh, meet some of those objectives by getting that water recharged into the aquifer and back to the river over time. The EPIC uh, allocation buy-down, we uh, provide grant funds for ag practices uh, that not only promote water savings, but also nitrate uh, reduction. Um, any uh, resident of the district can apply for these funds, but we do score them based on uh, the URF zone or the um, uh, depletion factor of where those properties lie. You can see the allocation buy-down uh, lease rates uh, there on that slide. Uh, this year, we've actually made some modifications to those and we'll be paying $15 an acre inch for uh, EPIC contracts only in the 100% depletion or 100% URF zone. That is a reflection not only of the changes in land values that have occurred since I first put together this slideshow about a year ago, but it's also a reflection in the change of the economics of agriculture, uh, ensuring that there is still a, a advantage to the land and well at the same time recognizing that we need to be fiscally responsible with our own uh, with our own finances is what resulted in that number. The EPIC bonus payment program, this is an important program that we use to keep lands out of production that have been out of production historically maybe for 10 or 15 years. This year we have somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 20 uh, some odd thousand acres that are coming out of CREP uh, in various different parts of this uh, basin. Uh, and we'd like to keep those acres in prep. So in order to incentivize uh, people that may not be just uh, real enthusiastic about about $140 an acre payment uh, from CREP, we'll give them a one-time bonus payment of an additional $50 an acre uh, if they agree to re-sign up. And that has been popular uh, in the past. 
we do a number of cost shares. As I mentioned, we spend uh, somewhere between two and four hundred thousand dollars a year on cost share. These are just some of the technologies that we have funded in the past uh, few years uh, because these are priorities for us. We prioritize and score based on what would be advantageous to the NRD. So you've got pivot packages and moisture probes and uh, drop nozzles, et cetera, there are areas that we spend a lot of money on. Telemetry program, we have 863 flow meters that have telemetry units on them. We initially uh, uh, worked to uh, put these in place in order to save the district money. Uh, but then we recognize that there is a value to the landowners as well, because they can uh, access uh, information uh, more real time so that they can make better uh, management decisions. Uh, we have been working with landowners for a number of years, trying to develop the right uh, dashboard slash application that they could put on their phone or iPad that they would use in order to make those better decisions. Uh, and we continue to work on that uh, to this day. In addition to that, we have sought to uh, implement alternative cropping uh, opportunities uh, just in order to reduce the, uh, the use of uh, consumptive use of water and also to reduce nitrate leaching. This is an example of uh, changing corn over to sunflowers. You could cut uh, water use almost in half. Uh, you could improve uh, nitrogen use. You can digest the nitrogen that's already in the fields with the sunflowers. Uh, and uh, we thought that this would be a pretty darn good uh, project. Unfortunately, the year that we tried this, uh, corn was at about six and a half dollars a bushel, so it wasn't terribly popular, but this may be something that we turn back to uh, here in future years. TAP H2O is a project that we've piloted for a, uh, uh, an organization that works on water management out of Colorado. <coughs> this is essentially a a smaller version of our telemetry program that is much, much less expensive, but it does require some, uh, the landowner going out to the meter and taking a photo for, to, in order to get the analytics on uh, water use and uh, uh, cropping yield goals and that sort of thing. So it's still a work in progress, but something that I uh, thought was worth mentioning here on some of the uh, activities that we are doing uh, to manage water. I think that everybody knows in our second increment of our uh, IMP, a major component of that is uh, drought planning. Um, we are the reason for that. The North Platte NRD undertook uh, writing a drought uh, mitigation plan about, uh, gosh, close to three years ago now. We were the second NRD in the state to, uh, to work on that. I think we've got the best plan. Um, and so it was a model for the IMP process, and we're going to be a model for the, many of the drought plans that are going to be happening here in the Upper Platte Basin. Stakeholder driven, uh, we had uh, several different outcomes that came out of that. Most importantly was education and drought monitoring. Uh, but also number four is quite important because it leaves open the door uh, for in, increased uh, regulation as uh, drought strategy, as the uh, drought uh, may warrant in the future. It allows us to develop additional strategies to, to uh, address uh, water shortages. We are working on climate adaptation. We are not an NRD that's afraid to uh, talk about climate change and what we're going to do as this uh, phenomenon continues over time. Uh, and so I wanted to point out that we have uh, really worked hard in order to gather more data as it relates to uh, weather and climate over time. And uh, wanted to point out that those telemetry units can be turned into miniaturized weather stations. We're working with the uh, state climatologist's office. We have two mesonet stations in this uh, district, and then we also have six NOAA-style weather stations. So ultimately, we could have as many as around 900 uh, different weather data points uh, in this district, which is far more uh, than anywhere else in the state and information that we can use to make better uh, decisions uh, for uh, not only for water users but for them to make those decisions for themselves. Some of the next steps that we're looking at doing in the future are um, a cover cropping program not just for soil health and not just for water savings ensuring uh, uh, soil moisture uh, remains but also as a carbon sink. Uh, there, there was a, a lot of research on utilizing carver, uh, cover crops to uh, capture carbon and utilizing that for credits. In fact, being able to sell those credits to different 
uh, entities that are uh, putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, we think that this may be an area that we may need to go into the future. So that's something that we're looking at um, uh, favorably over the course of the next couple of years. Another area is some of our research projects. We're working with uh, our very own University of Nebraska that's hosting this uh, uh, conference on a couple of different uh, items. The VRI speed technology to not only improve water use, but also improve, improve nitrate use. We're working with uh, a couple of specialists out at the research center. Uh, electronic metering, we're working with uh, the Water for Food Institute uh, on that project. Water use application to better monitor and control water use remotely. That's also a water for food uh, project. StreamNet is something that we're very excited about working with a, a professor named Jessica Corman, who is, uh, I think, in the final round of funding for uh, NET dollars to do uh, water quality monitoring here in the North Platte River in Scottsbluff County. And then we are working with uh, Dr. Gilmore, Dr. Troy Gilmore out of Lincoln, who is uh, helping us to. Uh, develop some uh, better ways to monitor, to utilize our monitoring well system uh, across the district. These are very, very important things that we're uh, focused on with our partners at the university and are, are grateful for those things. We have a couple of challenges. One is the grumpy guy on the left, the other is the calculator on the right. Uh, we'll start with the calculator on the right. We've got a down economy. Uh, we've got a uh, considerably uh, uh, lower economy today than we, uh, lower agricultural economy today than we did when I started here uh, almost seven years ago. And because of that, we've had land values drop. And as those valuations drop, so does our ability to collect revenue from property taxes, which is our most important uh, revenue stream for many of these projects. So that is a challenge. The second is uh, that guy on the left. Uh, it's a cultural acceptance question. Uh, the median age of, um, of a farmer in our district is 58 years old. And while that's uh, lower than a, a number of places around the country, it's higher uh, than most industries. And as such, um, those individuals uh, have a tendency to be more set in their ways than uh, people that might be a little bit more young and perhaps even naive uh, in uh, uh, looking at different ways to manage uh, their resources. So this is something that we've been uh, really working on with outreach and education and meeting with uh, landowners where they live, uh, hosting uh, uh, producer roundtables. We're going to be doing some field days in the upcoming uh, couple of years uh, in order to get on the ground with these people and, and help to understand what their needs are so that we can help to uh, meet their needs. That was a very quick overview of some of the stuff that we're doing. I know that you cannot uh, ask questions now, but I did want to provide my email and phone number and even mailing address. If you'd like to mail something into me, that'd be fine. Send me any questions that you'd like, and I'd be glad to try to answer them. Dave, I will turn it back to you. I hope that that helps. Thanks. Thanks, John. I, th I think that was an excellent overview. Um, in the stead of the audience, uh, since they can't uh, be here to ask questions, maybe I, I would ask one question of you. Um, I think you covered everything awfully completely, and it looks like going ahead over the next 10 years, you've just passed through the first increment of, uh, of LB962 uh, and, and embarking on the second increment. Even as you're looking at new ways of using technology and new ways of uh, providing incentives for growers. It looks like the essential regulatory framework that they'll be operating under should remain pretty, uh, remain pretty stable for the foreseeable future, right? Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're literally a, uh, uh, a victim of our own success. Uh, and I mean that in the most positive way possible. Uh, our allocation nets us about an 18,000 acre foot credit uh, per year, um, and that is against a first increment goal of 8,000 acre feet. So we have a, a much broader amount of uh, credit back to the river and back to the aquifer system than uh, many of our colleague NRDs do around the state. If you add to that the additional credit that we get from our retirements uh, and from our allocation buy-down program, from our temporary leases, you're going to be adding somewhere in the neighborhood of about 6,500 to 7,000 acre feet additional credit 
to that so that we are now in a position where we have uh, on average over the course of about the past decade uh, been in the neighborhood of about 24,000 acre feet of credit. The reason that's important is because we are going up against not just the first increment goal of 8,000 acre feet, but the ultimate goal of being becoming fully appropriated. The second increment is what I would loosely define as a catch-up increment for a lot of uh, NRDs, not us because we happen to have uh, met our goals, but there are several other NRDs that have not. So our goal this year is simply to maintain our level of uh, progress in this second increment, which is going to allow us to sort of not only do some of the things that I described in, in this um, uh, presentation, but also allow us to evaluate some more experimental ways that we might be able to gain uh, credit over time. I think these intentional recharge uh, projects are kind of a wave of the future. I think these allocation buy downs are an opportunity for us to reduce consumptive use while at the same time maintaining our, our uh, high capacity for yields and ultimately our, our economic health here. Uh, so we're in kind of a reflection period. We are focusing on some other things that, uh, that uh, relate to some of our other statutory responsibilities. We just passed a major nutrient management rule last fall that is uh, slowly being implemented over the course of this year that will be important for water quality. And then as I mentioned in the presentation, we're also looking at things that we can do for air quality. I think one of the most exciting uh, opportunities for us is to incent uh, more use of cover crops in order to reduce uh, or at least capture uh, carbon and, and utilize that perhaps even as a revenue stream for us in the future. Well, good. Sounds like um, uh, going forward, there'll be a lot to work on and a lot of good things to look forward to. I think so. I hope so. It keeps us busy and out of trouble. That's good. Okay. I think uh, uh, that should provide an excellent overview, and I want to thank you for taking your time to, uh, uh, to help us out, even though we couldn't have the conference this year. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to make this information, these resources available to people online. So thanks for uh, being adaptable with that, John. We really appreciate yeah. your time this morning. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too.